I sang that song for more than 60 years, a song of praise to Joseph Smith, the prophet of the Restoration and founder of the LDS Church, the church I was born into, the church I loved with all my heart and taught my children to believe in, the church I served as a bishop for five years. I knew the church was true. I knew Joseph Smith was a prophet. I was a faithful Latter-day Saint. My life has been built on certain truths, but wishing doesn't change the truth. I didn't start out challenging my belief in the church. Believe me, this new look at things has been gut-wrenching. I know there are those of you out there watching who are in as much turmoil as I was, but I hope that God will lead you to the truth Jesus said, you shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. When I finally learned the truth about the real history and doctrines of Mormonism, I realized that I was following the gospel of Joseph Smith and not the gospel of Jesus Christ. I have come to learn that many others have made a similar journey out of the bondage of religion and into an authentic relationship with Jesus. And that's what this show is all about. Courageous people who want to share their story hoping that you, the viewer, will discover the same new life in Jesus. So if you're a Latter-day Saint who is struggling with questions or seeking a genuine encounter with the Savior, we invite you to join us tonight. We have a joyful message that we want to share with you. So I'm really thrilled to welcome Sandra Tanner. Now you were married in 1959 mm -hmm. and, and in California, and then you stayed there for another year. Yeah. And then you came back to Salt Lake? Yes, in the summer of 60, um, we knew we wanted to do more research. Uh, this well, was just on your mind all the time, yeah, well, probably, it, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, we're jumping over <laughs> some things that happened in that oh, first year, though. Please. <clears throat> Uh, after we'd been married about three months, September I guess it was, Gerald wanted me to meet these people in Missouri that had been so influential on him oh, yeah. coming to Christ that still believed the Book of Mormon okay. and wanted me to go out and meet them. So uh, he had to work and didn't have any time off. So I went on the train back to Missouri, stayed with the people I'd never met before. And alone? Alone. And oh my goodness. Went out there for two weeks with them and uh, talked to them about all the problems they had discovered in the branches of Mormonism that they came out of. And then we spent a lot of time talking about what the Book of Mormon really taught and what the Bible really teaches, that it doesn't teach pre-existence, it doesn't teach work for the dead, it doesn't have <laughs> temple ritual, there aren't plural gods, um, that it's just faith in Christ. <laughs> but they still had the Book of Mormon, you know, but... Well, now, did they use the 1830 Book of Mormon or the way it's been changed since? Were they, they using a current Book of Mormon, do you think? They were... Well, it varied, uh, but they had gotten a photo reprint of the Book of Mormon and a lot of the 1830, and a lot of them used the 1830 hmm. edition. Okay. So I was fully aware of the changes yeah. uh, and everything at that point. Wow. Uh, <clears throat> So I was intrigued with what everyone was saying about Jesus and about God. And when these people prayed, they prayed in a way I wasn't used to hearing as a Mormon, yeah. like they really were talking to God, you know. <laughs> uh, now, I believe they were fully born again Christians, but they still were hanging on to the Book of Mormon. They just hadn't seen all the error mm. yet. And uh, so they did the best they could to talk to me about Christ. I came back home and then Gerald and I were visiting around different Christian churches and um, I was little by little starting to put together the difference between when a Mormon talks about eternal life and when a Christian talks about eternal life and salvation, that these were different, I knew they were different meanings but I didn't understand them. Same words but different Yeah, meanings. that was kind of hard to put together. Yeah. So. We visited different churches, but then finally I was at home one day listening to Christian radio while Gerald was at work, oh, and the minister came on and he preached from 1 John chapter 4, 1 John. 
Herein is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and gave his son as a propitiation for our sins. A new concept, huh? Yes, and as this man took that chapter apart and explained, you know, you're not naturally God's child, right. that this is spiritual adoption. You were a sinner that didn't deserve anything. God in his love loved you in spite of your sins. Hmm. So, and as a Mormon, I took God's love for granted. He's my daddy, you know. Yeah. Well, of course he loves me. Yeah. And... And I, and I knew I did, child. I knew I did some sins, but I wasn't really bad, you know. <laughs> and so as this minister preached, I started putting together what the Christians had all been talking about, that we need, we are sinners in need of God's grace, that we can't earn our way to salvation because yeah. it's all grace that we're sinners. What do we have to offer to the equation? Yeah. So it was through that sermon that I gave my heart to Christ. Oh, wow. But I still had that Book of Mormon. <laughs> and Gerald and I still believed the Book of Mormon for another two years. Oh, okay. Uh, visiting Christian churches, yeah. <laughs> which meant we didn't fit anywhere. <laughs> oh, that is odd, isn't it? So you had this feeling or belief that the Book of Mormon was true, true. but you had both turned your lives to Christ. and Yeah, you know, and you know. we kept doing our research. We're trying to explain to our families uh, that it's all about Christ. It isn't church. It isn't temple ritual. It's none of those things. You just need Christ. Yeah. Well, needless to say, they all thought we were crazy. So Sandra, you were, uh, you went back to California then to get married mm -hmm. and uh, you got married in Mission Hills, California. Yes, we yeah. had a Protestant minister marry us. Uh -huh. Yeah, and that was, uh, so you'd, you'd ended on, only ended up courting and dating and studying for two and a half months. Is that right? right? Yeah. <laughs> So it was quite a shock to my family to suddenly yeah. announce that uh, I was leaving the church, marrying an apostate. Oh, boy. And having a Protestant minister marry us. <laughs> <laughs> so. Well, so do you, how long did you live in California then after that? And then we, we lived in California for a year, oh. and Gerald worked as a machinist down there. Mm -hmm. We continued with our studies. Uh, we didn't realize it at the time, but Gerald's name was still on the membership rolls. He had asked for it to be taken off before he came to California, oh. and, but they hadn't done it. Okay. So he's still a member, and my membership was still in the ward, so uh, we kept getting the ward teachers okay. by, and um, uh, <laughs> that was, uh, we went through several. Uh, war teachers. War teacher. <laughs> you were challenging them, were you? <laughs> because we would bring up different things. Next, and we know the guy would have another partner the oh. next week. So did next you eventually month. meet with a bishop? And uh, well, I uh, I don't remember if we. She'll have to edit this out. I don't remember if we talked before about me becoming a Christian. Didn't we talk about that though? Uh, the Christian radio station. Uh, the radio station. Yeah. Okay. So even though I had uh, come to faith in Christ, Gerald and I still were hanging on to the Book of Mormon and still were members of the church. In fact, you kind of believe that Joseph Smith may have lost his way after 1830. Right. But, and so the things that followed, the polygamy and the Book of Abraham yes. and things weren't reliable, but the Book of Mormon was up through right. 1830, that he was right. still a prophet, so. Right, but then we decided to move back to Utah to be able to do more research. Well, I wanted to take care of my membership issue before we moved away. Oh, okay. And so I sent a letter to the bishop telling him I wanted my name removed. And they had a church court. Uh, two elders came to my house and handed me a summons to bishop's court. Wow. And so I went to court and there was the bishop and his two counselors and the ward clerk and me. Yeah. And I would brought several books in to explain to the bishop why I couldn't believe anymore. And his comment to me was to the effect of, Sister Tanner, the church is not on trial, you are. <laughs> and we're only here to determine whether or not you believe Joseph Smith's a prophet of God. So he wasn't interested in listening he to didn't anything want to, he, he didn't want to know anything about why I had a question. And I said, well, you already know I don't believe Joseph Smith. That's why I asked <laughs> for my name to be taken off. Yeah. Anyways, uh, so they finally declared me in a state of apostasy mm -hmm. and uh, uh, found me guilty of leaving the church. <laughs> yeah, questioning. So uh, then Gerald and I moved back to Salt Lake and that's when we found out his name was still on the rolls because we were living at first with his parents, mm -hmm. which put us back into his old ward. Oh, where he would grown up, I guess. Yes, so, yeah. and so his younger sisters uh, came home from mutual one night and said something about his name still being on the rolls at the <laughs> ward house. So then Gerald asked for his name 
to be taken off. So it looks like I left before Gerald, but the, it, Gerald really left first. Okay. He just hadn't formalized the pr paperwork on it. Now, was there ever the comments that we've also heard too about our, us leaving the church that there must have been something, somebody hurt our feelings or yeah. we just couldn't keep the commandments or did you get some of that? Oh, yes, I got a lot of that. Or but moral transgressions yes. or something. <laughs> and uh, obviously I'm a sinner. We're all sinners. Yes. But that had nothing to do with my disillusionment with Mormonism. No, strictly. Uh, I had been, as a teenager, I had been a happy Mormon, uh, content, I should yeah. say, content to stay in yeah. Mormonism. Uh, but when I was confronted with evidence that Joseph had rewritten his revelations, that his doctrines contradicted the Book of Mormon, yeah. that Brigham Young taught all sorts of strange doctrines they don't teach anymore, I realized this can't be the church I was always uh, taught that it was. So I voluntarily left uh, I didn't like coffee when I first left, uh, or tea. <laughs> yeah. That was uh, an acquired taste. And um, so there, I, as far as the word of wisdom, I could go back into the church now. I would yeah. have to give up my coffee. But, I, I mean, I could do that. If I thought God required that, that wouldn't be a problem. If you really believe Joseph was a prophet yeah. or anything, yeah. I paid tithing before I, when I was a Mormon, and I pay tithing now. So, yeah. uh, and not, but not legally, not as a means of eternal life. I do You're gaining salvation, uh, right? Yeah. I yeah. give money now to the work of God, as a desire of my heart, not because anyone keeps tabs on it. <laughs> so it's a different motivation. Yeah. As far as my general lifestyle, it wouldn't look that different than a Mormon's as far as moral living. Wow. But the, the motivation's different. It's yeah. because I want to please God, not because anyone's doing a checkoff list yeah. to and see if I'm worthy to go to the temple or yeah. something. You know? you, you've been born of the Spirit, and right. your eyes are open, and you see. In fact, what really impresses me about your whole journey is, uh, for us that are coming along kind of in mm -hmm. these last few years, we've had such support and such strength mm -hmm. from other people who have kind of said, you know, you're on the right track here. Mm -hmm. There is something wrong. Yeah. You didn't have any of that. No. You were just kind of out there on your right. own. I, I'm, I'm impressed that God would be able to, <laughs> are you, you've thought about that I'm sure before. Yes, but. we visited different Christian churches and as soon as we would tell them we still believe the Book of Mormon, oh. then <laughs> that would kind of be the, uh, you know, pull, they would pull back from involvement with us because uh, yeah, you kind know, of kind of thinking, we, but Book yeah, of Mormon stuff. Yeah, we're true. hanging on in Book of Mormon stuff. So, so we didn't. We had a little bit of support from the Christian community, but it was yeah. cautious. <laughs> yeah, I bet. Now, I know a family member arranged a meeting with one of the apostles with you. Was that yes. shortly after you got back to Salt Lake? Well, it was in the works before we left, and culminated after we got to okay. Salt Lake. My mother who had started the whole process by asking questions to me, <laughs> uh, was concerned that I was leaving the church. Yeah. This is typical in many Mormon families. Just because you don't believe it doesn't mean you leave. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> and so my mom's concern was I was leaving my heritage and my culture, and she knew it would alienate me from all kind of family members and friends. Mm. So she said, well, you know, it's one thing not to believe, it's another thing to leave. So she did not support me in taking my name off the roll. Mm. And, but we had talked a lot about first vision problems and, um, you know, what are the earliest accounts of the first vision? Did Joseph Smith understand the, uh, God to be a resurrected human being at that point? Uh, when did he start teaching that? And so we had a lot of questions about the first vision stuff. Well, my mom wrote to LeGrand Richards, who was an apostle back oh, yeah. at that time. Back in 1960, the church was only like about a million members, so it was easier to get access to a general authority than it is now. Oh, okay. And they probably uh, learned their lessons too, yeah. I'm sure. But <laughs> well, and I don't know how much she pulled strings being a Brigham Young descendant, but anyways, she contacted LeGrand Richards and. Uh, told him about my questions about the first vision mm -hmm. and wanted to know if he could meet with me and uh, see if he had anything to resolve the problem. Yeah. Well, he had written and told us that he had his grandfather's journal that he had recorded in his journal 
at the time of his conversation with Joseph Smith, back during Joseph's lifetime, when Joseph had told him that he'd seen the father and son and specified that it was the father and the son and those things. And so he invited us up to his office to see this journal. Mm. So I thought, wow, I can, uh, the research we had done at that point on the first vision, I couldn't imagine he could have such a document because everything we saw, the first vision wasn't being promoted in Joseph Smith's lifetime as important as uh, being father and son. Uh, the, the whole idea of plural gods was very late in Joseph Smith's teachings yeah. in 1843, 44 yeah. in Nauvoo. So we went up to LeGrand Richard's office and he had this piece of paper with typed extracts from the journal. Oh. <laughs> and, and he read us the typed extract. And Gerald says, well, where's the journal? <laughs> <laughs> he says, well, that sounds like in the past tense. I would, like Joseph's dead. It's yeah. in the past tense. I'd like to see the actual journal to see what the time frame is of him writing. Because he had told us this was written. The guy went home and wrote this account. This is on the spot stuff, see? OK. I'd like to see the actual journal. Well, Robert's got real offended that we were questioning him. And uh, so anyways, he took us over to the genealogical library and uh, had the lady get out the microfilm and showed it to us and turns right to that page. And uh, Gerald says, well, it sounds like Joseph's dead. I still can't see a date. Can I turn it back on the microfilm to look at an earlier entry to see what's the time frame of all this? And Richards got real offended and mad and told the lady to take it off, the <gasps> film off of the roll and said, if they come back, don't show it to them. They're just troublemakers. I've gone out of my way to show them this. Oh my and uh, so him and Gerald go off yelling at each other off to the elevator with me sheepishly <laughs> following behind. Now, <clears throat> I came back the next week and asked for the film. And they said, oh, what a surprise. <laughs> it's out for repairs. <gasps> and Is I said, well, real? it was fine a week ago. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Oh, well, I'm sorry. You know, they break. And OK, so I tried, I think, one or two more times, and it never was available. Well, I waited a year, and I happened to be up at the genealogical library looking up a Desert News article or something very innocuous. And I thought, while I'm here, I'm going to ask for that film again. Well, I had. The I had saved the call slip from when we were there a year ago, so I had the numbers. So you knew right where to go. Yeah, so I turned in the call numbers for the slip for the girl to get out the film. And she came back and she says, how did you have that number? And I said, well, I was here last year doing research and saw it then, and I've just saved the number. Oh, that explains a lot, because we don't have that in the file card anymore. It's not in the cabinet, you know. So I wondered how you had the number. And I said, well, you know, I saw it last year and I wanted to check something. Oh, okay. So she goes and gets the film. <laughs> and it's <laughs> and, not there. And uh, she gets the film. Oh. She puts it on the reader for me. And I sat down to read it. This is this man's memoirs in Utah in about the 1880 time oh, frame no. so it historically it doesn't prove anything for the first vision no not at all that late yeah and uh, so I got later I uh, told Gerald <laughs> well I finally saw the diary and it's just like we thought it's a late reminiscence isn't that interesting so and that was I think in 1960 so we've done research on the first vision ever since then yeah. and now we can absolutely prove and the Mormon historians even concede that uh, Joseph told several accounts of the first vision. When he first told it, he was not saying it was the father and son. That right. was a later development. And it wasn't until 1832 or later that it even that surfaced. That even wrote it down. even <laughs> wrote it down or even commented on it. Right. Because there's no other journals or diaries that discuss no. that first no. vision. Oh, no. boy. Well, so in 1963, this was about 1960. In 1963, you start up the Modern Microfilm Company. Mm -hmm. Is that right? And the purpose of that was to what? Well, we found that nobody would believe us when we told them we went to the library and we read X, Y, Z, and we'd write out the statement. Yeah. And, and they'd say, well, that's just your word that it says that. Oh. So then we got thinking, well, if we could microfilm these early Mormon documents and make those available to people, they could see for themselves that that's that what you the, weren't making it up. And that's what yeah. the records really say. And it would save you from going to the library to look at it. 
Yeah. Uh, if you're in New Mexico, uh, Virginia, wherever, mm -hmm. and you wanted to research Mormonism, you would have to go to some main library to physically be there to have yeah. looked at the books. And so our thought was we could film these old books, then you could just buy a microfilm yeah. and take it to your library and look at it and you'd be able to see that's what it was. And then we, so that's what we started out doing. And then we thought, okay, that's a lot of problem to <laughs> go through the step of a microfilm. So we thought, we'll get a printing press and we'll print the pages off the microfilm. And make them available and Make to them people. available. Okay. And so we did a photo reprint of the Times and Seasons, an early Mormon newspaper, the Evening and Morning Star, the Messenger and Advocate. Oh my. The first uh, seven volumes of the Millennial Star. Wow. And, and we started just doing reprints of all these old books so that you could sit in your home and read them yourself and find out if our references were right. <laughs> So that was the beginning, and then modern microfilm as a business never really made money, but that's what supported us to be able to do our research. So were you working other jobs at this point, or? Oh, <coughs> bless you. <laughs> <laughs> you have to do a little editing. <laughs> <clears throat> During this period, Gerald was working as a machinist, oh, okay. and so this was stuff that he so either did in the evenings or just days. Just on the side? You were yeah, on doing the it? side. How did you distribute stuff? Um, there was a man that had a little bookstore here in town, a used bookstore, mm. and he took our little reprints in to sell through his bookstore. Wow. And so gradually the word got around to people. The peop that you were out there. Yeah, and we even had the seminary and institute teachers coming by and buying our reprints. Yeah, because they could... Then they could sit at home and they wouldn't have to go to the library to do their research. Yeah. No matter what side you were on, it helped you to have the original documents. Yeah. And so that became the way of supporting our research. Wow. Then in, um, let's see, 64, uh, Gerald and I um, decided to uh, go full-time at this. Hmm. And Gerald... Uh, d proposed to me that we uh, try supporting ourselves solely from the sale of books. Wow. And that was kind of scary. Yeah. I bet. But God supplied, and uh, we moved into the house uh, that I'm still in uh, and set up our business in the front room. And that's there at, what, 1358? Uh, well, no, next this? door. Oh, my, next in door. my okay. house okay. was next door. And uh, so at first we had everything right there in our home. Mm. So it was <laughs> tough going financially, but yeah. uh, by doing the reprints of early Mormon books, it didn't matter what side you were researching, you could use those materials. And right. so we were able to and find they were just a, factual, so yeah. yeah. So we found a market for them, and that's also when we did our big uh, Mormonism Shadow Reality book. That was back in 63 then, was it? That you uh, well, did, we, did yeah, that, the that? forerunner yeah. to that. Okay. Uh, we gave up the Book of Mormon in um, the end of 62. <laughs> now, when you say gave up, I guess, again, you had been holding on to the idea yeah. of the Book of Mormon. Anything after that wasn't. What, what really triggered that thought process? Well, Gerald had been troubled for some time about the plagiarism of the King James Bible in the Book of Mormon. Mm. And there are so many King James phrases through there. 17th century kind of stuff. Yeah, no 15th, one says 16th. these and thous at, <laughs> in Joseph Smith's day. You read the newspapers of his day. You read his talks. Uh, you read his letters. No one's saying these and thous. And you don't suppose Nephi is saying it either, probably. No, he's <laughs> not using King James. So. Alma. So it looks like Joseph Smith is simply lifting out of the Bible to make the Book of Mormon sound more biblical, more, more like a Christian document. Yeah. We started to be more aware that there were problems with uh, where the Book of Mormon could have happened. Uh, were these people <laughs> even in existence? Uh, how do you validate this book? And so as we started more and more looking into those things, we realized it was very different from the Bible, yeah. from the Book of Mormon. Uh, by then, we'd studied enough of the Bible to know that it has maps. 
Yeah, and archaeology. And, and archaeology else. and artifacts and museums and the Book of Mormon has no maps, no artifacts, no yeah. museum, nothing. Well, I know when, when Joseph Smith called missionaries to, to go to the Lamanites, mm -hmm. he sent them to Ohio and yeah. places west there. Yeah. He didn't send them to South America where, you know, the church and everyone yeah. seems to say the Mayans or whatever, mm -hmm. all these Indians from Central and South America. but. There's nothing in the Ohio right. or anything that would indicate that these were Hebrew uh, people or anything. So <laughs> Right. So uh, I read a book called uh, The Golden Bible by M.T. Lamb. Lamb was a minister here in Utah in the 1880s. Mm. And he gave a series of lectures on his problems with the Book of Mormon. And then they were put into a book. And when I read his book... It was like someone turning a telescope into right focus. <laughs> All of these different pieces finally came together, and I started yeah, realizing, wow, the Book of Mormon doesn't make it as a historical document. Yeah. And it doesn't matter how much it talks about Jesus or how inspiring one might find it. If it isn't the record it claims to be, then it's a fraud. Yeah. It, it is not a record of can't, real people. can't be both. No. 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 The other thing... Missionaries knocked on our door when we were married but didn't have any children. We were always incredibly strong and faithful in, in the LDS Church. Joseph Smith was a prophet and the LDS Church was the only true church on earth. You didn't even think that there was any world outside Mormonism. And we just kind of dug in and never gave it a second thought. You know, just following the religion, the Mormon religion, was, was all I needed. I believed, I believed it with all my heart. We had a real heart for the church. We believed in the church. The LDS Church was, was the only way. Even though I was living the commandments outwardly, I still felt like something was missing. There's the things that you kind of put up on the shelf. I wanted so bad to, to not know that. And you begin to feel the weight of that shelf, it eventually breaks. What if what you've believed all your life isn't the real Christ? It does have eternal consequences. God began to change my life in amazing ways about six months into my two-year mission experience. 